Hey, it's Andrew here, and welcome to the E-Commerce Fuel Podcast, the show dedicated to helping seven- and eight-figure brand owners build incredible businesses and amazing lives. And this last, man, I don't know, last, last month or two, a couple months in the forums, we had someone joined, a uh, super smart gentleman by the name uh, of Harel Levi, and he has really impressive story. He has bootstrapped a brand to eight figures, which in, in and of itself is, is pretty impressive, but he has done that. In less than two years, less than less than actually a year and a half, about sixteen months, I believe. And I I reached out to him and I said, uh, "Man, this is such a, a very unusual story. I'd love to have you on the podcast to talk about this." And he said, "Well, I'd be happy to do it on one condition, and that's that I don't share the brand because we're getting a ton of copycats coming here and talk about this. And uh, if you're cool with that, I'm happy to come on." And of course, said I was. So. Uh, Harrell, thank you for being in the forums. You've been a great member. Can't wait to dive into the story. And uh, you've got a pretty unique way you've built this. Um, so welcome to the show. Welcome to ECF. And thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure being in the forum. And there's a lot of great people there. And happy to be here. Yeah. And you are, we talked about this before, but you got a beautiful look. I've seen the sun set uh, over the water. You're just outside of Tel Aviv or in Tel Aviv. Um, to give people the setting where you are because it looks like a pretty awesome place to be able to uh, to be set up for for working on something like this. Yeah, definitely. I live uh, I live by the beach actually. I love I love surfing. I think just in general, having sports in your life is something that it's very healthy, even business wise, uh, because sometimes you know when you do sport, the endorphins and the excitement also can you know sometimes uh, have an influence on on the way that you approach business. So yeah, so I moved there. Um, three months ago and and yeah it's been uh, fun ever since i'd love to focus on kind of from the outset about mindset and when when i asked you like hey what are you best at you you talked about a lot about this and some of the prep that i had done for the interview in terms of presentations you'd made or even talking about it with uh in, in your case study in the forum and you hear the word mindset right and like i think a lot of people maybe myself included sometimes tend to write that off like, oh, it's, this sounds very woo woo. You just need to get in and, and do the work, et cetera. But my, my, you, you are adamant that like your mindset and the, the way you approach this business was absolutely critical in making it work. So talk if you would a little bit along the journey, um, maybe two places, maybe we can start with what happened uh, when the factory that you had built in China for, a, I'm guessing a previous business for drop shipping business yeah. kind of just got, got cut off at the waist in COVID and how you used mindset to get around that. And then also maybe how mindset has played a, a large role in helping build this business. Definitely, yeah. So uh, happy that you ask it. I think it's it's a very, very critical um, part of the success. And when I started, I started with dropshipping around seven years ago, um, less than seven years ago. And I saw posts on Facebook, started with dropshipping, thought it's cool. Um, it was um, been going pretty well, open a factory. Um, and then basically um, a big crisis with COVID happened. Um, we had to close down um, pretty big factory to food build, a lot of investments. Um, and I think that's something that was key to my opening the, my new company is having the right mentality. One thing that I really love to do is I love to look up to very big people. Sometimes it can be in business, people run nine figure businesses or even in life, people who are succeeding in life. And you will see that one thing in, that's mutual for almost all of them is having the right mindset. So I think, you know, you can have the best tactic in the world, the best strategy, but if your mindset and if you're going to look, I think very big and negatively, it doesn't matter because whatever the first bad thing that's going to happen to you, you're just going to make, you're just going to stop. We're just going to make the wrong decision. And then that doesn't worth anything. So I think, having the right mindset and just have look at things very positively and asking the right question is something that's very crucial. So, I mean, you had, you kind of downplayed it a little bit, but you didn't just have a, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you just didn't have a factory that you were working with. You went over there and actually built out a factory, yeah. built it up from the ground up. So this is much more than just like, Hey, let's go and, uh, and source some product. This was your factory on the ground in China. All of a sudden you're cut off from it with COVID, just a huge disaster. Um, mm -hmm. You lost almost seven figures. Talk a little bit more about how you actually use that mindset to build the brand. Yeah. So, so I was, I had like, I think three weeks of one month of just, you know, playing, a, I don't want to say playing a victim, but just 
play, kind of playing a victim or like why it's happened to me, uh, you know, um, a lot of thoughts of, you know, my friends were going out. Um, I was working 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and then I lost everything, all of, all of the saving from like a lot of time. Um, so it's, it's very like, it's okay to have, to have that, to have a place for that because we're humans, I think. Um, and, and the second thing is that a lot of time is for me, what it's came down to the fact if I want to stop or I don't want to stop doing business. Um, so I had really like, um, basically, um, uh, two, two weeks that I had to stop to decide, do I want to close this company or like, do I want to close business in general and become being hired by other people? And then I remember how much I, I was never working except being a waiter. I never worked under someone else. And I, I just remember how painful and how annoying it was because I cannot take orders from anyone else. Just my personality is built this way. And then I told to myself, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to fight to the last, to the last thing. And, and, and then um, I think a lot of reading also came into place. Like I tried to really like, and that's something that I learned from, you know, I think um, a guy named Simon talked about it, but also Mark Manson. And um, it's also like kind of a Satoist mindset of just look at the thing as they are and not trying to judge things very early. And then when I look at the raw, raw, info about myself i was like okay i was spending millions of dollars on ads and i didn't have an ltv and then it kind of hit me you know what if i'm going to do that in the right way this time and and i think a lot of a lot of it is just being mature of forgetting about the past and forgetting about what happened because you can look at the past all the time but it's not going to help you right um so just be having this excitement of, of opening something new and just changing that mindset, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you need to have the place for, for you to feel bad or like to feel that it's, 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 it shouldn't happen to me or all of those kind of things, but also you need to get up and, and, and start again because that's, you know, that's life. Talk a little bit about your rule of five. I think this is a very, uh, this is very smart and I think it requires more legwork than I think that most people are willing to put in, but I think it pays huge dividends for you. Yeah, definitely. So, so I, so this is an optimized version of something that I learned from, uh, from a mentor of mine, but, um, basically the initial advice was if you want to go on, you know, let's say you want to master, um, uh, influencer, right. Or like master like negotiation, right. So the first thing is to read five books about that topic. And then you kind of get a grasp of how, what's the truth or what's the reality on this topic. Right. But basically reach out to them, have a call with them via those platform. And then um, after you do all of those five calls, see what is the mutual thing that all of them say. Usually there's going to be one or two things that all of them say, if, if most of them, if not all. And that's the thing that it's as close as the truth as it can get. Because if you think about it, like every expert has, let's say one of them, you know, scaled the uh, um, beauty brand with retention, like he has his own subjective experience, but with that, you know, sub subcategory of skincare. And then there's another one with, um, let's say home decor. But once you find the common thing that all of them are doing, then that gives you like the right direction to go. And sometimes like growing is not about working hard, it's just about working in the right direction. Um, especially right now where in the landscape changed so quickly and there is um, every day like new technology and in new ways. So I think that's, that's something that can be even more beneficial right now. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, quickly before I, I, I really, I'm excited to dive into how you built your marketing department. Cause I think it's one of the, the things uh, that's, that's most fascinating, but before to not skip over too much. So you had the factory close. You lost a ton of money. You're in the spot where you've got to figure out a brand. And you had a, a list of eight filtering questions, which I think is awesome. Um, and they were, I'm going to just read through them and then dive into a couple of them more specifically. You, wanted, you were looking for a niche where there were multiple brands of eight figures already. Growing industry, can I improve on their product? Are there holes in their current brand? Are they doing SMS and are they leveraging Amazon and Etsy? And let's start on that last one first. Like leveraging Amazon, that makes sense is the opportunity there, but Etsy is a little more surprising. So why did that one make the list? Why was that important for you? Yeah. So, uh, for our brand, it makes a lot of sense because we sell, uh, we sell kind of unique products. Um, 
And I think just having been in, in like multiple um, marketplaces is crucial for growing like a big brand because sometimes Facebook is not going to work well. Sometimes uh, Amazon is going to have their time. So, but having it's like mainly kind of like spreading your eggs in, in several areas. And, and again, it's a lot of initial work. Um, to set up, you know, and, and doing uh, SEO and all of those platforms and ad and PPC. But basically, that's um, a lot of time. That's that's something that's going to save you when you have, let's say, a, um, a bad month on Shopify or a bad month on Amazon. Um, but again, for that, it's it's a lot of, we did a lot of tests. We did a lot of, um, I think for Etsy specifically, um, it was mainly the visuals that make the difference and the messaging. Uh, and and you see something similar on Amazon where um, like you need to understand like how user interact. Like for example, on Amazon they're gonna they're gonna basically move between the first images, uh, one, two, three. So making those changes where it, like basically uh, kind of a Pareto law, making changes on the most important thing, and just being very very aggressive in, in testing that will yield the best results rather than just do a lot of small changes in, in areas that maybe people are not even browsing. Um, so yeah, basically our growth came from a lot of, um, a lot of visual split testing. And uh, for Etsy, there is also like specific uh, keyword research that you need to do. But yeah, it's, it's mainly that. What percentage of your business comes off of Etsy? And, in, and like how good of an opportunity do you think it is in 2023? I just think about the, the members that we have in the forum. And obviously, there's a special niche, right? Like if you're if you're custom made things, if you're home goods, if you're kind of more artisan, that that's kind of just the perfect wheelhouse for Etsy. So it's very niche dependent. But e- even still, like there's I don't know that many people that are on Etsy that have built big businesses. I know very few, in fact, or even medium businesses that are leveraging as a channel. So do you feel like there's a lot of opportunity that people aren't tapping into? Yeah. So the, uh, Etsy is not even close to being. Amazon or or very, very far, uh, to be honest. The the difference between Amazon and Etsy is on Etsy, you have high net margin because their fees is much lower. So I think it's all about the balance. So let's say with Etsy, we get like 10 to 15%. um, But that's something that with a high net profit. So everything basically balances each other. So same with Amazon, like Amazon is much bigger, but with Amazon, you get much higher fees. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think just having it, it's like, it's like, for example, it's like having SEO, but even if the SEO gonna gonna have gonna bring you ten percent, that's gonna bring you ten percent, but in a very high net profit. So I think just balancing everything, like sometimes it's it's more like it's more than just uh, one plus one. It just gives you the breadth, the the basically the depth of of having to let's say be able to hire more people or be able to grow the business much much further. So yeah. If you, I'm going to ask you this on the fly. It's kind of a hard, potentially hard question given it's kind of multifaceted, but easier to probably look at like the revenue that's contributed based on Amazon versus Etsy. What percentage of your profits do you think come from Etsy? Um, just ballpark. It could be 5%, 30%, just v- as ballpark as you can get. Um, I have to check, but I think it's around like 20% maybe. Okay, like wow. That. I mean, that's pretty meaningful for a platform 50, like that. 15 to 20, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, our product is very specifically um, for Etsy. And also one thing that you need to remember is that a lot of our Etsy traffic comes just from the fact. So when when you're uh, throwing a lot of money in ads, a lot of people are going to search your brand name. And then basically what happens, like we have, and you will see it with a lot of brands that like you definitely want to be in, in all of the first page. So they're going to see your site and they're going to see the Amazon link to your site and they're going to see the Etsy link to your site. So mm. we do suspect that, um, sorry, sorry, our Etsy link, but we do suspect that some of our Etsy orders coming from people who saw our ads, but then they are more happy to make the purchase with Etsy because Etsy has, is, is very customer favorable. I would say it's more customer favorable than Amazon. So Etsy is very, very, you know, um, have a very uh, um, emphasize on that. Um, so I think some of our orders on Etsy comes from just our ads, but just in an indirect way. Um, but yeah, in general, I just want to be whatever whatever your customers at. So you know, you you would even see it to, ex- to an extent of nine figure brand that they have ads, but you see them in retail and offline, and, and basically, you know, when after someone trusts you and after someone um, saw your ad or like you, dip it, you definitely want to be whatever they are. 
um, whatever medium they are, whatever or, or how they search you. Yeah. Does Etsy has have its own in platform ad network, or are you using mostly Facebook ads, other ads to drive the traffic, either just to brand awareness traffic and then people search for, or directly to Etsy? How are you getting traffic outside of just brand awareness and search, organic search to Etsy? Yeah, so we're not we're not doing any external traffic to Etsy. We try that, and then um, basically Etsy algorithm is very sensitive to conversion rate. So if you send irrelevant traffic if you send a traffic that that convert less than the in-platform traffic on etsy that's even going to hurt your ranking on etsy we tried that we tried to send like a lot of traffic to etsy and we basically thought okay etsy is like amazon that you know amazon favor off 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 uh, off site uh, um, traffic basically because amazon want to bring more people to their ecosystem but etsy is different etsy algorithm somehow is just um, very, very geared toward conversion rate. So for us, we basically just run in the ads platform inside of Etsy and nothing more. So, oh, sorry. So I missed that. So there, so there is an ad platform inside of Etsy. Oh, there, there is, but you can like, it's, it's inside of, um, Etsy. You are limited, I think to $1,000 a day at max. Mm. And basically you you basically um, uh, making like um, advertising inside of Etsy platform. So Etsy have a partnership with Google. So sometimes you will see like Etsy product in Google, but that's going. That's something that you don't have any control. Etsy decide whether to whether or where even to show your ads. Um, so you just up. It's very very basic, I would say, compared to Amazon or Google. Got it. So safe to say that you are most profitable traffic. Uh, in your most po- profitable customers, when you consider fees on the platform, when you consider like advertising spend, all that kind of stuff comes from Etsy on your brand. Yeah, but Etsy is not Etsy is not scalable um, to the extent that we want. Obviously, it's it's another it's another channel, um, and that's that's exactly what it is. Another channel like like um, you know like SEO. Um, so it's not something that we obviously tried a lot of time to scale that, and we thought okay, like. Etsy charge much less than Amazon, but guess what? The, the, the amount of visitors in Etsy is maybe, I don't know how much, but it's way, way, way lower than, I don't know by, by, by an extent, but maybe just 1% of Amazon, I don't know, um, or like 5%, but, but yeah, that's, that's the, you, you also need to be aware of the size of the platform, right? So like sometimes that was one of our mistakes. Like we tried to scale the Etsy where there's nothing to scale because that's the size of the platform, right? Um, so that's something that comes with, you know, understanding the platform, but also seeing what, you know, what other people are doing inside of it. Got it. Another one that you mentioned was, uh, what are the holes in their current brand, uh, in terms of the criteria when you were looking for a niche to, to launch this, this brand in the, in the U S versus the, the previous setup you had with the factory in China. What do you mean by that holes in their current brand? Yeah, so we, we look at, we sign up to their email flows, we see if they have SMS, we see um, are they, like, how much they basically, um, if, they, if they're doing a new product launches, or like if we can improve the, the brand in general, like if we are going to do something um, similar to them, like do we have enough, um, I don't want to say innovation because innovation is a big word, but can we offer something better, but something with a higher LTV than they and if so, like, for example, if this product um, can be moved into a subscription some sort of way or, or if this product, um, if we can offer complemented product with a higher uh, margins or just something that's going to make sense on that, um, because we definitely wa- don't want to just see someone else that succeed and just do something similar because you're going you're, you're gonna to lose in this way, basically. Yeah. What were the things that you saw? And again, without getting specific enough to out your product, of course, but what were the things that you saw uh, that that you were able to improve upon? Yeah, definitely. So um, that, by by the way, the my my speaking that you watch, it was I think close to I think it was one year ago. So something changed back then from there. Uh, but basically, what we have seen is uh, most of them didn't do SMS. Um, a lot of them have uh, the customer support um, wasn't um, wasn't good, and customer support can be a profit center if you if you know how mm-hmm. to to do it. 
So a lot of time people see, you know, customer support is just customer support, but I think it's just an opportunity to be close to your customer. Um, and second, and, and the third thing is that we knew that our product quality will be better than them. So the first thing that we did is just order samples, seeing how the packaging looked like, um, seeing if they have any messaging on the packaging, seeing if they, if they have a way to uh, basically communicate us in several mediums uh, after we sign up to the brand or are they just doing Facebook ads? Um, so yeah, so that's the thing that we checked and, and yeah, I would say, I would say once you, once you know that you have something better to, to offer or something that ticks a lot of the boxes, then you can definitely try it, try to do it. You mentioned SMS and I think it's interesting that like of all of the, uh, of all of the marketing things you were looking for in terms of holes, one of them was SMS. That was one of your, your seven or eight questions. Um, safe to say you you were pretty heavy on the sms marketing and it's a big driver for for your brand yeah definitely so uh, i think it's just another like the difference between sms and email like the i would say the relationship that you get with sms is different than the email because in the sms it's very hard to give value in an email you can it's more easy just just uh, because of the medium of sms mm-hmm. is very you know uh 30 years ago um, but with SMS, a lot of time, especially um, especially when there is um, season of, of Q4, or things like that, uh, we find that if we send, for example, if we send a blast also in emails and also in SMS, like we can get, we can we can double the revenue just because a lot of time people are gonna miss your SMS, but they have 97% open rate. Uh, sorry, they're gonna miss your email, but they're gonna have 97% open rate in the SMS. So. Part of the strategy is just to, when you grab the pop-up, like try to get the SMS as well. Um, and then obviously um, don't just, like in SMS, it's very hard not to give value, but again, like you don't want to over, over send them promotions, but just do it in a, in a way that you can, you can basically add another medium to, um, to get, to basically get the second purchase and third purchase. Let's talk about how you built your marketing department. Um... I think this is really interesting. Safe to say, well, not safe to say. Did you build? It, it was was most of the traffic you invested in Etsy, of course. You had Amazon. Um, from a traffic generation perspective, was most of your paid traffic through Facebook ads, or did you yeah. do a hybrid? Oh, it was okay. And so you talked in in the video I watched about media buyers versus creative strategists. Um, and so you had kind of this triangle: where you had a media buyer, a creative strategist, you had a video editor. Uh, you had you and I think one other role that I'm missing. What was that my, last role? Yeah, my COO was su- supervising all of this. COO, basically. thank you. Um, what's the difference between a media buyer versus a creative strategist in your eyes? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. It's two different people. Um, one of them, so for example, media buyer will a lot of time uh, be kind of a gamer type of person. They're going to be very numbers oriented. Um, Also, there is some test online that you can find, you know, personality, but uh, creative strategies is something that it's you like 95% of the time. It's not a person that's going to love numbers. It's something that's going to throw, like going to have a lot of ideas. Um, And that's why like a big mistake is just trying to having two people, basically two roles in one one person, because it's very, very rare that someone can, can basically to tick in those two boxes. Um, so yeah, so we're trying like when, so our creative strategies is mainly someone who is very, very creative, but he can, she can see something and then get like three new ideas from that. And then the, the, the most important thing is having a, a video editor that's going to support her ideas basically. And then, uh, the, the, um, basically, um, the media buyer to communicate, Hey, this is good. This is bad. This is the this is where people are dropping up in the video, um, and I think once you have that combination, and also one thing what we do, we have a KPI for this entire department because we want to have like a mutual responsibility. Like I don't like I, you want people to work together. Um, so basically, when you set goals to this department, it's it's you set goals as a team because you you definitely need them to work as a team mm-hmm. and not just the media bar. Okay, I need to maximize this one, but also. Um, the strengths of the communication between between them going to dictate the performance that you're going to have. So, um, so I think it's something that's very important to to focus on. So, could you talk about? Could you run through? Let's say, let's say you're trying to get a new ad campaign up on Facebook. 
could could you run through the process of how it might look? Uh, and I'm guessing it's not just it flows through like water in a pipe. It probably goes through, bounces back. There's some feedback, and then it eventually makes its way through. Talk us through the process, if you would, between all those players in your marketing department. Yeah, definitely. So our creative strategy is basically browsing for for play. I think it's called um, like the the platform to get basically save a lot of ads from the ads library. Um, what, what's and, the uh, what's the URL? We'll probably gotta be careful with URL. So with uh, give me uh, it's name there. for <laughs> yeah yeah maybe you don't want to get to the wrong side here. Um, Forplay.co. Um, it's basically a um, basically an app that allow you to save a lot of ads from the ads library, but also going to um, gonna give you a lot of kind of discovery ads. So um, our creative strategy is basically uh, saving uh, favorite ads to foreplay. And then she came with the hypothesis. And then, then she and the video editor are working on, on creating like uh, several variation of that. It can be, you know, one body with like three to six different hooks. And then um, they send it to the media buyer and the media buyer is testing that. And basically the media buyer is giving them the feedback. Hey, this is, uh, it worked, didn't work, worked. But for example, a lot of like the watch time was good, but um, people didn't click or should we add urgency here in this video? Or like, so it's, it's a lot of iteration, I would say. Like, like one mistake that we had is like we expected to, you know, to land just in the first iteration, which usually doesn't happen. So it's a lot of iteration, um, but also it's very important sometimes to do like a big swings to change, you know, maybe to change the format, maybe to change the, um, basically to change the theme of the ad. So, so yeah, so that's why the, the creative strategy is just browsing all day in foreplay and seeing what's working. And we, we try to get as much as inspiration from, from other brands and see if we can make something similar. And how many roughly you're doing a lot of testing here to uncover the winners. How many bad eggs do you have to go through and iterate on and test to get a, a winner? And, and let's not even, let's just say one that performs, you know, at, at 75 to 80% of average for, for campaigns that you keep for a while. And I know you're refreshing them over time, but, but what's your, what's your hit to failure rate on a process like this? Um, I would say it's, it's, it's very dependent also on the iteration. So in iteration one, it's something that's going to be very low. I would say maybe uh, one to two out of 10, but then um, in the second iteration, you just try to optimize like specific part of it. So for example, let's say the video performed, but um, the hook rate, the hook wasn't good enough. Like not a lot of people uh, went to the first, uh, watched the first three seconds. So the chances in the second iteration where we have, you know, the same body clip and then we have diff different like new hooks based on that body will be will be higher maybe um 30 to 40 percent but but again it's it's the dividends from having like a strong creative will just mm -hmm. pay for a lot of failures so in the ad so so it's, it's basically also a game of of having a lot of output but a lot of output in different sorts and, and shapes yeah so you're almost frankensteining is uh, maybe it's not a real sexy term, but it might be appropriate. You'll take three or four ads and you'll say, okay, the hook on these was phenomenal, but then viewership dropped off. Or, hey, uh, the hook here was terrible. But other people that watched this section, like people rewatched. And so you'll kind of take use that to combine the, the videos to get the best parts of every one. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. It's very important to analyze the video, like every everything that you launch, you know, basically. Um, and then trying to really ask the right question, like, why does people drop off in this second? Like, what happened in this specific second that people drop off? Um, and, and the more you get granular with it or, like, the, the creative strategies uh, get granular with it, like, even if it's going to have five new answers to why people drop, maybe one of them is going to be good. So then you get, like, a new variation or, like, let's say new five variation where, you know, people in the four second uh, that usually drop don't drop. And then the um, the conversion can can go up like twenty percent. So so it's a lot of it's a lot of testing. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that it's very very important. It's something that I don't do at the moment. But but uh, yeah, our, our team is very um, very geared toward that. What you talk about the video editor? How, what kind of content are you putting in here? Do you have a video editor that's using? How much is it like stills that are animated uh, versus do you have a do you have a 
uh, talent, like an on-camera talent that films with the video editor? Do you get a lot of UGC? Is it a mix of everything? Like what are the raw materials that your video editor is working with here? Yeah, so a lot of UGCs, we have a lot of uh, hundreds or, or more of UGC content. And then basically the first thing is just to try to find, okay, like what's the theme that we're gonna, we want to work on? And then we're just browsing all of the UGC that we have and trying to create that ad. Um, so it's very dependable on the team. We, I think, almost solely using UGCs that we we're getting from customers or customer tag us. Um, but a lot of time that's going to be enough. Um, and a lot of time content that looks very raw and very authentic going to outperform something mm -hmm. professional. Like we, we did try, you know, hiring studios in, in very high amount. And, but some like most 90% of the time, the, the UGC content will outperform that if, if we do like a very methodical, you know, iteration of that. Got it. How did you find so media buyer, creative strategist and, and video editor? Uh, those are kind of like this this trifecta that makes your your demand generation engine. Though getting really good people in those roles are, are critical. Where did you where did you find those people? Can you talk about how you found them? Where they where they are? are they you know where in the world they are? Um, and then what kind of how did you vet them and train them? Like talk a little bit about how you you got them on your team and built them up. Yeah, so so we basically um, we hired them from online jobs uh, from the Philippines um, and. We basically, what we have is that we have several layers of, of hiring. So the first thing is that we create a job post, but we create a job post with like, you know, like something in there. We create like a very long uh, job post. And then in the middle, like if you read this far, have uh, um, like right banana or something like that. Um, so then you get like someone who actually have an attention to detail and not just, uh, there is a lot of people who just, you know, they're applying for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and also something that we are doing right now because our company is, we have a lot of employees, is something that we have a referral that help us to get, I think, two of those three, uh, like people uh, referring their friends. Um, so that's, so the first stage is that, then the second stage is that we're trying to have, we're we having a Google form basically where um, we, we see also the resume, but also we ask them, actually right now we're doing it with ChatGPT, like where like the, the first thing that you need to ask is like, what is the difference between a good hiring to a bad hiring? So for example, in the creative strategies is, is also, it's going to be the ideas wise. So I'm, so for example, like I would ask ChatGPT, Hey, like, can you ask, can you give me like three to four questions that gonna, um, that's gonna, gonna, uh, make a person that's creative to stand out, for example. And then that's the question that, that's the answer that we expect into. And, and then um, that's the second stage. The third stage is basically um, basically having a homework for them. So if it's long, it's going to be paid. If it's not long, it's going to be, uh, we're, uh, we will not pay for that. And then basically the, the thing with the homework, like for example, for the video editor, like we, we give them UGC that we right now have, and we don't give them any, any basically any, um, any restrictions. Like we tell them, like, do what you think. Because we really want to see where this person is going through. Like, and that's something that's going to allow you to see their natural tendency to like, if they like to do like fast cut, if they like, if they have this ability to keep the viewer um, entertained, right? Like you will see it from the get go, specifically for the video editor. Um, and for, after the homework, like we will get like, um, I would say five to eight people. Um, and then after that, we basically start like um, two weeks trial, uh, paid trial. We like to hire two because a lot of time if we hire one, it's just going to be the Murphy law and he's not going to work for us. But once you hire two, you a lot of time we find out that two of them are good. So we don't mind. Um, yeah. And after that, like, yeah, you, you put them on a paid trial. Like um, I have like I have a rule that the, the way that they're going to show up in the first day that's how they're going to show up in the rest of their career with you. Like if someone is in the first day making you excuses, like I did made this mistake in the past where I give a lot of another chance and another chance, like, um, but it just doesn't work. Like this is the personality of a person. Like you cannot change that. Um, so we, we like to, if we don't see a fit, then we will cut pretty fast. Uh, you, you use, a lot of uh, testing, like uh, IQ testing, PSIU, which I'm not familiar with, High Five, which I'm not familiar with. How do you do like a Myers-Briggs personality test as well? Talk a little bit about those, if you would. Like, 
um, maybe those three IQ, PSIU, and High Five, wh- what they help you understand about the candidates and, and how important you think that's been to the strategy of getting good people on the team? Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, I made a lot of consultation calls, and that's the kind of the system that I, I get ended up with. Uh, because I had this problem of hiring, and I think that's the biggest problem for any business in any size, especially the, especially when you go when you grow, like you find out that you cannot do a lot of things because you're one person, you have 24 hours. But um, so basically, the uh, the high five test is a test that I think like two million people uh, took. It's a free test online, and it's a set of questions, and after that, it's going to give you kind of your top five strengths. For example, if you're analytical or strategist or creative, and I think they have a list of, I don't know how much, but maybe like 40 different traits. And after someone goes through this high five test, you will find out their top five traits. So this is one thing that we do. Another one is a PSIU test. So a PSIU test, it's, it's a test that, um, and, and uh, basically that's, I think that test costs like 20 or 30 bucks. Um, but companies like Apple and IBM are doing this test before they hire someone. Um, that test is going to give you um, basically PSIU theory in, in one minute. It's, it's basically um, um, divide all of the people in the world to four types. So there is um, the visionary, which is, mainly, um, which is mainly like the leader of the company or the, the, um, basically the CEO of the company. And then there is the, it's called the innovator, basically. Uh, so let's say in my company, I'm the innovator. Um, and then there are also the producer. Producer is someone who is very good in short-term task and short view, but it's a, it's, he's a hard worker and he moves in a faster pace. So for example, if I would want to hire a video editor, I will make the PSIU test and I would expect the results of a producer because I need a big, I need a lot of output for this specific role, right? Um, and then there is also the stabilizer. So for example, my COO is stabilizer. Like the people usually who manage department are stabilizer. They, it's, 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 he, he or she move in a slower pace. They're doing a lot of quality control. They're very, very structured. So they're going to create an Excel with like five different colors for basically everything. Um, but that's something that really helps when the business grow, because you're going to have, that's avoid basically having a chaos in the company. Um, and that's also complete in a way the innovator, which I can testify on myself that I'm not organizing a lot of things that I'm doing, but but that's why I have someone uh, opposed to me that is the exact opposite, right? Um, what's the and the, what's the website so, for the PSAU te- or PS the PSIU, not PSAU, right? Yeah, so it's PSIU. Um, I think it's like organizationalsomething.com, uh, organizational physic. Dot com. I can send you that later, and you can put it in the in the notes. Great. Um, and yeah, we do that test for almost every hiring, and and we found out that's that's another filter that helps us to kind of because a lot of time you know there there's also a lot of time there's going to be the cost of making the the wrong choice, right? So inevitably you're going to have a lot of wrong choices because that's how you know that's how you grow a business. You make a lot of mistakes, but. Obviously, the goal is to minimize that as much as possible. Um, and yeah, and, and this is about a PSIU. So we also use that and we also use the uh, personality test. I think it's free. It's, I think, 16personalities.com. How do you do the IQ test? So what's the tool that you use for that? Yeah, I think there is a website called IQtest123.com. Um, <laughs> yeah. We actually, it's very funny because... I did this test myself and also my CEO and also a friend of mine. And it's very, very accurate to the results we already have. It's going to probably going to be different in like three or four points sometimes, uh, more or less. Um, but this, the need for this test is because A players doesn't work, cannot work with people that slow them down. And that's going to create uh, frustration in the organization. So you want, you want to have smart people in your team, basically. So... Um, we use an IQ test, um, uh, we doing the classical intelligence test and, um, we having that as a filter as well. That's amazing. I'm still, uh, I love the process here. What, one thing shifting gears a little bit here and, uh, kind of for the last question before we jump into the lightning round, you, you get a daily report about how your business is operating, uh, to your WhatsApp on your phone versus your email, which I thought was interesting, right? Like 
most people get it on email or they'd have a PDF sent to it, uh, have them have PDF, some, you know, something usually wouldn't get it on their phone, especially on WhatsApp. Like that's not exactly where you're doing business. Why do you do that? Talk about the, the, the thought process behind that. Yeah. So basically the idea is that, um, so it happens when we grow, like we have areas that we don't tackle early enough. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of time I will be a lazy person. I, I would, I would rather be a lazy person, but working smart. So having something that's sent automatically to your WhatsApp and give you the breakdown by each channel of, you know, uh, profit and loss or growth from yesterday and all of those kind of things. Um, it's something that's going to help us. Like I, like you get at in 10, 9, 10 a.m. in the morning and then, you know, exactly. Okay. I want to focus today on, let's say Google shopping. I want to focus today on that one. I need to check what's going on with this area. And a lot of time it's, it's a very common problem when, when you have several things that you need to take care of. Like I know for myself that I will, like, I have some, some, I think to this day I have subscription to stuff that I, I thought about canceling like a long time ago, but it's it just because you, you cannot optimize or you cannot remove fat from area that you cannot see. Mm -hmm. So basically um, when you get that report to your WhatsApp, like every day um, you, you, you see it first thing in the morning and you know, okay, like the first priority for the day is to check out what's going on with this one. And, and then I'm going to do this one. And, and I think a lot of time, like you would have, I know it's happened for us. Like we would have several days that one area will be uncovered just because like I didn't have the attention to go to that area um, or like I didn't have the attention to really dive deep into fixing that. So that's another reminder of, of things that need to be fixed. Got it. Love that approach. Um, Aurel, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for walking through everything and, and especially like, I mean, just doing it uh, out of a spirit of generosity. We're not talking about your business. You're not getting impressed from this. You know, it's just, it's, you're just being kind and willing to share. So thank you for coming on and doing this. And if you, uh, if or when you meet him at an ECF event, if you see him in the forums, uh, give him a thank you because it's, uh, it's awesome stuff. So appreciate it, sir. For sure. Uh, we're going to cap this off with a lightning round. So just like the name implies, I'm going to fire a bunch of questions at you. Uh, feel free to just give me the, the, the quick and dirty answer. Uh, you know, a couple of words or a couple of sentences at the most. How would you describe the e-commerce environment in one to three words right now? Uh, crazy. What's one of the fondest memories from your childhood? Uh, playing at the soccer, soccer with my friends with no phones and um until the sunset basically all day oh that's awesome uh if you weren't living in israel outside of, or in tel aviv right now where would you live and why uh san diego the weather there is just perfect a favorite well i guess i was gonna say favorite product that you sell but we can't uh i can't, <laughs> I can't ask you that one on this one what's the hardest part of your business um the hardest part of my business i would say to being optimist no matter what that's mm. something that you learn with time let's do this let's do the favorite product that you sell but not for your current business but for your previous business the one that you had the drop shipping business or previous drop shipping that you were going to go vertically integrate on with your factory what was your favorite product that you sold prior to this business you bootstrap yeah yeah we were sending shoulder bags and that surprised me because it's we got such an amazing response like from people um and i thought it's pretty cool because a lot of times it's things that we designed from scratch and you get the response from the customer and that's, that's give you a really good um, feeling of, okay, I had this idea and now it's, you know, thousands of people bought it and happy with it. So I think that was one, uh, one of a very uh, fun win that we had. Nice. Uh, how much money in the bank is enough? So you can either say, take this two ways. Uh, one, you can say lump sum in the bank. Hey, if I had 5 million, 10 million, hundred million, whatever it is, uh, if I had this in the bank and I never made any more, that's okay. I'd be fine. Um, I'd, be, I'd be enough to live a good life. Or you can give it on an annual income basis. You could say, hey, uh, if I had half a million per year in income, two million per year in income, 100K, whatever it is, every year for the rest of my life, that would be enough. So whichever way you want to tackle it, how much is enough? Yeah, I think it's obviously you can take it for a lot, a lot of different ways, but I think five to 10 million uh, that would be the answer. How many hours a week do you work? I work, I think, around six to seven hours a day. 
six seven hours. And I don't work. I don't work on weekends. Uh, I work. Fr- I work Friday half day, and um, Saturday I don't work. So yeah, and I work on Sunday because that's how I live in Israel, and that's how we uh, we work on Sunday basically. Uh, number one hobby, and you can't say can't say work. I love surfing. Um, I got into it when I moved to live on the beach, and I think it's something that's it's just different than anything. Yeah. So, how long have you been surfing for? How many years? Uh, not even years. I think like I think I started last year, and then I moved. You know, right when I moved when I moved to live on the beach this year, I'm surfing much more. So, um, yeah. So I think it's pretty fresh for me. Maybe I'm that's. That's maybe that's another reason why I'm excited about it. I don't know. I hope it's not going to pass, but uh, it's been very fun so far. How's how's the learning curve been? I mean, I've I have uh, I'm a very terrible surfer, uh, but it's 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 rough. Like when you get out there, it's got a steep learning curve. How's how's the uh, progress coming along? Yeah, so I think I had like eight lessons, and then after like the fifth or sixth lesson, I learned it. Uh, but yeah, I, I remember in the, in the second lesson, I was like, okay, I'm never going to learn. I, I, I will never be able to surf because I was falling every time. And then the, the and, and I, I really don't like to fail. Like, uh, but, but yeah. And then the teacher told me like, Hey, listen, it's, it's like, it's okay. Everyone catch it. And I was like, everyone catch it. And he was like, yeah, yeah everyone, like, don't worry. You're not going to be the first one who's not going to learn how to surf. So I think after like four, after the fourth lesson I, I got really good at it and then after the six or seven like i started to you know to do everything by my own and and that was very fun nice yeah those early days i remember the first time i ever went surfing was a trip after college with a good friend cashed out the the uh, roth ira my grandfather had given to me and said hey don't if you don't touch this it will be worth millions of dollars when you're 60 and i was stone cold broke after college i was like this is an emergency i need to go do this so went to costa rica and we got some boards and went out to this break. We had no business being on this huge break. It was a coral break. So like super, super rough underneath and just proceeded to spend four days getting absolutely annihilated. I don't think I caught a wave in four days. I just rubbed a half of the skin off my chest. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was my introduction to surfing. Had much better days after that, but it was a little, it was a rocky entry for sure. Yeah. That's um, on, that's a time. Yeah. What? Last question. Who's one of the most interesting people you've met through ECF? This could be, and obviously I don't know if you've uh, met them in person, but it could be just, it could be someone you, you know through the community um, or it could just be someone that you've seen, someone you've seen posting that you are impressed or have appreciated their contributions. Anyone stick out in terms of a name? I think I have, I have several that I talk with, uh, with the group, with like the eight figure uh, forum. Um, but a really good friend of mine recommended to me the group and his name is Ben Immerman. And, and he was literally like telling me, hey, like you have to join this group. Like there's awesome people there. Um, and I think it's, it's been very, very fun. And just the, the, the good thing about the community, like the best thing is that you find people are like, it's, it's very rare, especially, especially in, in some certain uh, scenarios to find someone who's been through this exact situation to this exact path. And I think that's something that it's it's very it's unparalleled uh, to other things because it's it's there is very kind of um, generous and and an abundance mindset and I think it's great. So yeah, so it's been it's been fun. Great. Well, Benny, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Um, Arel, thank you so much. This has been phenomenal. Congrats on the success. It's it's obviously so well earned, and I love like the systematic way in which you do things. It's it's. Uh, it's pretty impressive as well as your focus on mindset doesn't get talked about a lot. So excited to release this one uh, and stoked to have you in the community. Thanks for being here and looking forward to seeing the forums and, and hopefully in person soon. Thanks. That was fun. Have a great day.